I'm George Whipple. Welcome to the Tilly Foster Farm Museum. The museum is run by the nonprofit 501C, the Whipple Foundation for the Preservation of Putnam County. And it's your family farm, so come visit. It's open 365 days a year, and it's always free, and it will be as long as I'm alive. We raise critically endangered early American farm animals here at Tilly Foster. And we're very lucky because world famous artists and breeders and authors come to talk at Tilly Foster. What we have here is a collection of antique machinery from the 1800s to, say, the 40s here at Tilly Foster Farm. Uh, and we're going to have a show here today, and I'll show you how this old well machine works from 1890s. I'll start it up. This was used to drill water wells in the 1800s. I've got to put the belt on it. That's how you put that on. Uh, then you come back here and you put the clutch in. And the table turns and that's how it drills. This machine brings uh, solid cores of hard rock out of the ground. You drill till you hit a fissure in the rock, and that's where your water squirted in the well from. I got a sample of water here pumping out the bottom. It was originally steam powered in 1890. Then it was converted over to a gas engine in the 20s. You had to pump water when you drilled. It kept the bit cool and the dust down. And it was a, a Kelly bar machine. The round table that you see rotated. And that's what did the drilling. You... It, has a, it has a Rockford clutch on it that kit engaged to turn the table. And it was run by a nine horsepower Fairbanks. They could drill about two to 300 feet deep with it, sometimes 400 if they had to. Then it got so, the tools got so heavy they couldn't lift them up out. What's that up there? That's a water swivel that lets it rotate. Plus you can, the water pumps down through the center of it. And as it was drilling, you'd let a little more weight down on it, give it a little spool, a little more rope off. And here's some of the rock core samples here that it took out of the ground when it was drilling. That's solid granite. And this Right. This, uh, this is solid granite and it was took out of Holmes, New York with this machine. And this core here is a limestone core that I actually drilled with this machine. The bigger one. So what is that for? What is the line for? What does that do? Well, that's how it drilled. It, it cored the rock out of the ground and you had to keep coming out and taking the cores out. It was before the old chop drills. What did that achieve? What did that do? Well, that's that had that left your borehole once you come up and took the core out. The hole was like a gun barrel once the core was removed. What is this here? The, uh, steel the steel shot was used for an abrasive. 
it got into this slot on this piece of casing here. There's a notch cut in it. Uh -huh. And that was the abrasive. Nowadays they use carbide teeth for a core bit. But back then it was a they used steel shot. What's the looks like a stove there? Yeah, that's a ladle. That's what they poured it in the, up top with. They poured a couple of things of that in. Where exactly did they pour that in? Where? Up top, there's a Y up there. When that come down to the bottom, then you undo the plug up top. Right here above the water swivel there. And where's the water swivel exactly? Right here, the black thing with the hose hooked to it, that's the swivel. What exactly does the water swivel do? That lets the the Kelly bar rotate while it's pumping water down. There's a packing up top and it don't let the water leak out. Okay. What's the... yeah. It was real important, especially for a farm where they needed a lot of water to water the animals. Uh, they needed to have a lot of water, so they needed to drill a well. Can we talk about a little bit of the things in the middle of the... Uh... That's the, the gear train, and also the other thing with the gauge on top is the water pump. That's what's pumping the water. The engine has a, a belt on each side. One drives the table, the other drives the water pump. So with this one here, this green one, what does that do? The big one, that's the engine. That's a nine horsepower Fairbank Morris. Uh, then the littler one behind it is a Myers water pump. Pumps, pumps about 10 gallons a minute. And this here is just the... That's the gear train. Uh, when you put the clutch in, that rotates your gear. Yes, that was my father. He uh, started our well drilling business in 1958, and that's when that sign was made around 1957 to 58. Uh, and he knew the guy that used to drill with this machine. But on this side you can see the belt that runs the water pump and also the suction line for the water pump. And then you can see the copper pipe that runs. You can, you can see all the water lines on the water pump and then the one hose goes up to the water swivel. Where are the water lines? The, this red line is your suction, and then you got your other one that goes up to the top of the water swivel. See the hose going up? Well, wait a minute. Where's the red line? Right here. Okay. So this is what now? That's the suction line for the water pump. And then the copper pipe that's running along the side there, that's the one that goes up to the water swivel. And that pumps the water down the hole while you're drilling. And why is it built this way with the wood? How is the structure uh, supporting? Well, that's what the, the long ones that are at an angle are called stiff legs. They're what hold the derrick up in place. The, the, the derrick, you crank that up by hand with a big hand crank, and then once it's vertical, then you bolt the stiff legs to it. And the wheels, uh, anything special about the wheels? No, it's mounted on an international harvester. They called it a truck, but... I guess, guess it's a wagon too. But the, the wheels are mounted, you're saying? It, it, yes, it's, the rig itself is mounted on an international harvester wagon. So what is an international harvester wagon? What is the significance of that? Well, they mounted different things on them. You could get, use haul hay with them or firewood, corn, whatever the farmer needed to use it for. They mounted different things on them. And, and it was horse drawn. This was pulled with oxen. Oh. They used a pair of ox to pull this around because it weighs 7,500 pounds. You had to have something strong. Right. And uh, I got some photos of when I first found it. 
It was in the laid on the ground. It was rotted beyond recognition. That's when I first found it, and I never touched it. The wood, most of it, had turned to earth. Uh, and here's another picture of it when I first found it on the bottom left here. It was on its side, and it was completely in ruins. But I had to take it home and had the crazy idea of restoring it, and I did. Why did you want to, how did this crazy idea come about? I mean, what made you think you could restore it? Well, I was brought up in the well drilling business. My father started our business in 1958, and that's, that's all me and my brothers have ever done. So when I found this, I thought it was the ultimate find. And it took me two and a half years, uh, nights and weekends, to restore it in the top left photo shows it fully restored also with my 39 Chevy with my oldest daughter Cassandra standing next to my car uh, then all the way to your right is some photos of it back in the day 1922 February 7th uh, that's actual photos of it and then the one on the bottom in the middle is when the machine was originally steam powered. You can see this. A little bit further away. You, right you, there, right there. you can see the steam coming off of the steam engine. There's also a pile of coal in the very bottom left hand corner. Where's the coal exactly? It's right here in the bottom left hand corner of the photograph. You'll see the pile of coal for the steam boiler. That's in the late uh, 1890s. And is that your uh, ancestors in your family? Or? No, I, I'm not sure who they are, but they're pictures of this machine that I got from the relatives that had it. What's this picture here? That's another original photograph when it was steam powered. You can see the table and everything. It's the identical machine with the water swivel and all. Also, the one above that, you can see the box with the steel shot in it, with the ladle in it, just like I have. That's the that's uh, the Beal families. I'm not sure. I think the guy with the hat leaning on the stick is uh, is Harold Beal. Say, say it again, what family is this? That's the Beal family. The Beal family. Yeah. They also had some of these machines that they drilled with. I believe this machine drilled the well here at the windmill at the Tilly Foster farm. Because it's a five inch core hole and it's done about that era. In the 30s, when the chop drill came out, then these kind of faded away. They were a wooden structure. They went to a more rugged design of a steel frame and a four cylinder gas engine. Uh, so it just got outdated. You know, they had more modern machines mounted on a truck that you could drive rather than towed behind by animals. It was converted to an internal combustion engine probably in the late 20s and uh, that's what's running this now is a nine horsepower Fairbank Morris engine. Um, how much does it cost to run this all day by current standards? Uh, it, it burns about five gallons a day if you run it all day long, five to six gallons of gasoline all day long. had to take your pick over the last century, would you choose this one as the most uh, revolutionary, I mean the most the most functional, or was it the one that came? Well, I believe this a machine like this is what started uh, the rigs that we have today, the technology that they use today, because we still use a rotary drill uh, today's times. So, which, which parts of this machine stayed on in the later generations of machinery? Uh, the rotary design where, the, where it turns. They still use that same system today. So the same, okay. And is there anything about this machine that's your baby that you, that's a special part of this machine? Or? 
Well, just because, uh, because I knew the people that used to own it, Lester and Des Davis, they were a friend of my father's, and that that makes it worth having. So today's a big day. For yeah, it's a big day here at Tilly Foster Farm. And can you, any other pictures we can look at? You can narrate a little bit? Uh, yeah, I've got a, a, a letter over here from Howard uh, Porky Cutter. He's a master groundwater consultant. And he states that it's the only one known to exist that's been restored. And it says, to his knowledge, it's the only completely restored rotary core drill known to date. The 1926 Stover gas engine that I restored, it was featured in Gas Engine Magazine with my daughter Allison. Uh, since, since I restored this well rig, I got the, the engine bug where I collect and restore antique gas engines and water pumps. Uh, this is my collection, some of it here. There's more up in the small museum here at Tilly Foster Farm. And this is clearly a much less, uh, would it, is it less productive because it's smaller or what is it? Uh, yes, you, uh, you use different size engines for, for the application. If you had a small pump, you'd use a smaller engine. Uh, they were used to pump water on the farm before electricity was around. Oh. When they didn't have electricity, you had to run, a, whether it be a corn grinder or a, a hay press or a water pump, that's what you use, an internal combustion engine. Well, I got a small version of a gas engine and a water pump, and then I got a larger one. What's this here? The, uh, the, uh, just the other, what's this? This is a Deming water pump that was used to pump water on the farm. You had to run it with a gas engine. If you had a hand dug well or, or a drilled well, that's what they used. I've, I just have a hand pump here for display purposes so that people can see it actually pumping water out of an old pump, out of a hand pump. And what years were the hand pump uh, used? They were from the 1800s. Some of them, they had them before that even. I've seen them made out of wood, probably the 1700s. This here. That's a 1914 Novo gas engine, four horsepower. What did that do? What was the... that is, that's a vertical engine. It's a little different than the Stover. It's uh, the, the piston fi uh, fires vertically. And that's running a big Deming pump with a four inch bore. Pumps. What was that top there? What did that mean? Well, they do that once in a while. They get some stuff underneath a valve and they backfire and it clears themselves out. So it's a good thing. Yeah. Well, that pump has to turn in a certain direction. There's an arrow on the back of it, you'll see. And you have to put a twist in the belt in order for that pump to turn in the right direction. What was the time in history when these were mostly developed it's the it would be the industrial revolution uh, yes mid right yeah the 1800s right on up to the night late 1900s Did, was there any affiliation with the Siemens company or uh, no that there are that's a Deming oil right pump they date way back Gould's Deming that particular pump there come off of a big estate down in Westchester it was down in the ground about eight feet in a well pit. And I uh, picked it up out, me and my brother, with his hoist truck, and I brought it home and restored it and mounted it on that wagon. It's, it's, it's nice to have everything all restored here on the farm so other people can enjoy them, and it's also educational for our children. Does it help children understand 
the in greater the greater context of where things came from. Right. So they have an idea how, how it was like years ago instead of today's age with the iPods and cell phones and everything. Uh, they didn't have none of that stuff. They had there was a lot of work involved back then. What did the work back then do contribute to our sense of community and, uh, on farms? Have we lost that with all the technology we have now? Yes, uh, it's, it's a way different type of life now. Uh, things are simpler, the tractors are more modern, they have air conditioning, radios in them. Uh, you know, they didn't have that kind of stuff back then. You know, they had to work twice as hard, longer hours. Now they don't have to work as hard. Is there anything else that people should know about these, an engine like this that, that is not common knowledge? Something well, they have what they call a make and break ignition on them. They, they fire when they need power or when they're put under a load. They're not like today's engines where they fire continuously. James Boyce of Salt Point, New York. I restored this engine about 30 years ago, this Ryder Erickson hot air engine. It's a Stirling engine, not a steam engine. These engines were used on well-to-do estates back in the late 1800s. This engine cost $210, which doesn't seem like much, but at that time a school teacher made a couple hundred dollars a year. So only the wealthy people had them. So that would be about uh, maybe 30,000 a year. Right, many thousands today. It's a, a coal burning uh, engine and they made them wood, coal, kerosene, and gas. This is the coal burning version. I found this laying down in a swamp where it laid for over 50 years. The building rotted and it fell in the mud. And people told me I could never restore it but I took it all apart. It took me two years to get it apart and another two years to restore it. And it's run several thousand hours since. It works on the principle that you use the cold of the water and the heat of the stove. And it's the differential of the two that it works on. And what is, can you talk about, as I start down on this end, what's down here? Okay, we have a pail of coal here with a little shovel in it. That's pea coal, hard coal that we use and then we have a chopping block and we we split pieces of wood of the uh, southern pine is the best kindling wood we can get split it up for kindling to start the fire and to help rejuvenate it when it gets down it takes about a pound of coal an hour to fire it it pumps 350 gallons an hour will lift 27 feet pushes the water into an open tank in your attic so in the 1880s, you could have flush toilets and running water. So this was a big part of the Industrial Revolution. This was, you know, but you had to have money to have this. It was, you didn't find it, the, the average person did not own one of these. Who owned this? Uh, what kind of person? Was this this upper was, class, upper middle class, middle class? Uh, rich people had them on rich estates. Actually, this came from the R.G. Hill Estate in West Park, New York, which is outside of Highland across from Poughkeepsie. And this supplemented the windmill. When the wind didn't blow, they'd run this. You'd run it for a couple hours, and you'd have 700 gallons of water pumped into, your, into a tank in your attic, and then you'd have your gravity water. They didn't have to run it all day long. It was just occasionally that you ran it to make up your water supply. When did this go? When, when did this lose its significance? What replaced it? And well, by 1900, it was replaced by gasoline engines. It was an outdated piece of equipment. But there's a lot of interest in the Sterling engine today, and there are models being built and people working on real use of Sterling engines. So we're going to see it come back. The original patents go back to 1816. 1816, okay. 1816, the original patents. What happened in the 1800s that made for so much industry and so much revolution in terms of industry? Is there anything in, in general that... Well, what got this particular uh, idea started, Robert Sterling, a Scottish minister, came up with the idea to pump water out of mine pits. Because steam engines were more dangerous, and this was a safe way of something to have in a mine pit to pump the water out. And he used the cold water 
and the heat of the stove to uh, run the pump. And not a lot of power. And it's it's uh, about a quarter of a horsepower to run a, uh, a pump that'll pump 350 gallons an hour. The water pump is right here on the side. That's the pump. That's the business end of it. As it pumps the water from the lower pipe through it, it pumps it through the jacket of the cylinder, through the upper pipe into an open tank in your attic. The tank simulates the tank that you would have in your attic. And when this loose fitting plunger drops on this side and it goes down within a quarter of an inch of the, of the base, it displaces the air up around it through the transfer port over to the hot dome heated by the stove. That expands the air, pushes another loose fitting displacer up. When it comes down, it pushes the air back and you reach all the same air. So it's a constant loop and you don't replace the air. There is no exhaust. Why wouldn't they use these today? What? Well, for the amount of iron they put in, it was inefficient. But there are, the idea is coming back and they will be able to make them very light and you will, you will see a Sterling engine. They made them, uh, uh, Phillips of Holland made them in World War II to power generating plants for the Signal Corps. And the beauty of it was, it didn't have a high voltage ignition and so on to tell the enemy where they were. Was that the most, was that the most significant thing historically in the war time about the machine? Well, it was, it, it was a way of running a generator the signal core radios took more power than today's digital, you know, today's equipment takes a lot less power. They took not, not major amounts, but they took more electricity than you get from just a little battery that you, today, uh, our communications are run on such small amounts of power. But the Phillips of Holland made those. I've never seen one, but they did make them. It's a 1949 beaver riding garden tractor comparable to the cub cadets and like that they make today well these were the first real production tractors of this size and you could put a mower on it a plow cultivator they were very popular for snow plowing and uh, a sickle bar type mower on the side this is a sickle bar mower here no, this one has no attachments on it at all. I have attachments, but I don't have any on this one. Um, it was restored 20 years ago from a pile of rust. In real bad shape when we got it. How did you, uh, how did you restore this? We took it apart, sandblasted every part, painted them, and reassembled it. Add a lot of parts to it? Or? Um, I had a couple of parts tractors that I got parts from that I needed. What was it used for in its time? What? Well, they were very popular for snow plowing, mowing, plowing a garden. Uh, so these mowed lawns? Oh yeah. So the mower was out on the front. Where is that? Right out here. On a pipe framework, where it would have been. And did it look like mowers did the hand mower things in the 50s and 60s? That's exactly right. Yes, that's what they looked like. So you could tell how effective, you could tell how effective the mowing was. Yeah, 